First Palm Media. You are listening to Mushing on First Palm Media. Visit our website at mushing.com. Hello and welcome everybody to the Burled Arch Podcast. I am Robert and I am joined tonight by my co-host Michelle. And we are on our second day coverage of Iditarod 24. Man, it is going to be an interesting weekend. Tomorrow is the ceremonial start. Sunday is the restart. And then we are literally off to the races. I'm looking forward to this for sure. But before we get too far into this, Michelle, how's it going tonight? You know, it's been a whirlwind of a week, and I mean that figuratively as well as actually. Uh, the wind here has been absolutely crazy. So much so, Robert, I think we're going to address the wind and the trail conditions later on tonight. We are, and we have a couple of special guests, and we're going to invite them in in just a second. But before we do, we want to sort of set the stage of what's happening today in Iditarod. As we talked about last night, it was the Mushers Banquet, so we have the starting order that we're going to talk about in a little bit. And then today is really all about last-minute preparations. All of the Mushers are getting all their, their gear together. They're doing the last picks, if you will, of their teams. They're figuring out who's going to go out on the ceremonial run. We'll talk a little bit about that in a second. And they're making all of those last-minute preparations before they pack up the truck and then head into town tomorrow. Also on Friday, it's typically a day of meeting with uh, sponsors and friends. Uh, in years past, there were a lot of parties happening and meet and greets and autograph signings and all that. I saw a couple of people are doing that downtown tonight. I know that um, Brian Reddington is getting together with uh, Eddie Burke. Uh, obviously we know the deal with Eddie Burke, uh, not running Iditarod. He, he, uh, pulled out of Iditarod for many, many other reasons that we may talk about later in our coverage, but they're getting together to do some autograph signings and poster signings tonight at a, at a gallery downtown. So there's a lot of stuff happening in Iditarod today because tomorrow whether you think so or not, that is when the fun begins. It's more of a circus atmosphere down there tomorrow than anything else, at least from a musher's perspective. But from a fan's perspective, that's where the action is. And speaking of fans, we have two Iditarod super fans on. They are calling in and joining us from San Diego, California. They are a husband and wife team, Richard Weaver and Patty Christensen. Guys, welcome to the show. Thank you. We're glad to be here. We're thrilled to have a chance. We, we've we listened to shows for years and years, and we love it to have a chance to pop on and be able to be part of the show. Well, thank you for joining us. We're pretty good friends with Richard and Patty. Uh, Richard is uh, my coach and my doctorate program, so we spend every Friday night uh, hashing out the intricacies of academic writing. So this should be a, a different sort of conversation that we're, we're not used to having. So I'm looking forward to that. But the way that this works, guys, uh, for folks that are listening and for Patty and Richard, we're going to go do a give and take type discussion about all things fans on Iditarod. And it's interesting because in years past, Michelle, I have sort of been that musher perspective of this. I give sort of that that view, if you will, of the race. And then we had Tony and Alex, who were really our fan perspective. They were the ones that were giving their thoughts on, on that side of things. What do you think your role has been when you've been on the show, Michelle? Well, I've always kind of been the cheerleader, but <laughs> anytime that I have um, had to host the show on my own, I've always referred to myself as the handler. Okay. So I typically give the handler's perspective. All right. So without further ado, let's start with Patty. Uh, what in the world is up with you and Iditarod? Maybe introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about who you are and what you're all about and how you got involved with this crazy sport. And was it before or after you met uh, your your husband there, Richard? 
Well, that's like 12 questions, but uh, so I'm Patty Christensen. Um, I, for work in the San Diego area, I am a psychotherapist and counselor as well as a professional storyteller. So I get to wear a couple of hats there. Actually, one of the things about that has drawn me to Iditarod in the sport of mushing is um, it is a very rich story kind of a sport. So that's a good piece. Um, the way that we got involved, and particularly I got involved uh, in 2010, we decided to do a road trip to drive uh, the Alaskan highway from San Diego going up to Alaska. Um, I wanted to do that, especially my grandfather was one of the civilians who worked on building the Alaskan highway in World War II. So I always thought, wouldn't that be great to drive there? And we had lots of good adventures, but we ended up, we went on a tour in Fairbanks. They have a boat tour that you go up the river and they take you to places. We went by Susan Butcher's kennel. And one of the things they talked about, just as an offhand thing that says, Susan Butcher and Joe Reddington took a team of, of uh, dogs to the top of Denali. And I was like, whoa, that's amazing. And my husband said, that couldn't have happened. That's ridiculous. Nobody can do that. So I took that as a challenge. I suddenly said, I am going to find out this. So wherever we went, we, we went to different places. And I was said, hello, do you know anything about taking dogs to the top of Denali? And we met a number of people, Rod Perry, we, we met and he said, actually, some of my dogs were part of that. We went to Iditarod headquarters and we saw the sled that went up there. I'm like, see, it's really a thing. They went there. But by this point, we had started to meet people and see things. I'm like, you know what? This might be kind of interesting. So by the time we we got, went home that day, I'm like, I think I need to find out more about this. And the next couple of years, we began following the race in earnest. And before we get to, to Richard and his introduction, a couple of things with that. Uh, just a uh, a couple of months ago, we had on Tekla Moritz, uh, Monson, who is Susan Butcher's daughter, and she talked about doing that tour that you talked about on the riverboat there in Fairbanks. And she, they, they literally pull over the the riverboat, and she's on the side of the shore, and she's given the Iditarod story from from their perspective. And uh, it was a wonderful interview. And for folks that are listening, uh, you can definitely find that over on our mushing feed. Uh, that is is definitely a cool story. And one other thing, um, one other thing, uh, uh, Patty, is we were just recently down at the lakefront. It used to be called the Millennium, the headquarters of Iditarod, and they have that. Uh, they have those pictures of of Joe and Susan as they crested uh, Denali with those with those sled dogs. And Michelle talked about that, I believe, last night. And maybe we'll jump into that in a second. So yeah, it is a very interesting story and history for sure. And I am so glad that you're here with us, Patty. Richard, tell us a little about yourself. Well, I am a retired college professor, which is why I'm still interested in academics and uh, helping Robert with his dissertation. Uh, my connection with the Iditarod goes way back. Uh, I remember back in the 70s uh, following the Iditarod in the newspaper, which primarily at that point meant there was an article that the race started and how many racers, mushers there were. Uh, and then there'd be another uh, two weeks, three weeks later, there would be another article saying the winner has crossed the, crossed the finish line and no, okay. But I was interested. I had a, a dog at that time, a Norwegian elk hound. Uh, and so I was interested in Northern breeds. And so I, I followed as best I could with the lack of technology that we had at that point. Uh, I too wanted to drive the Alaskan highway and when we heard the story about going to the top of Denali, I thought you only it was a technical climb near the top, so I couldn't see how they were going to haul the dogs up. Turns out there's a path 
that is actually climbable without having to go straight up with ropes, uh, which they took the, took the dogs. So I, I, was, I was convinced. Uh, we had a wonderful time that uh, trip. And one of the things we did when we were at the Diderot headquarters is we got our first ride behind dogs. And uh, we were trying to decide who was the, uh, the musher, but I think it was Rimey Reddington, uh, who was picked out the dog. We had to watch the process of how excited the dogs were to be able to, to go and then how fast they took us through the woods as we did that circle for uh, about 20 minutes before we got back. And uh, in some ways, I've been interested in Diderot before, but that really hooked me when I had a chance to actually be behind the dogs. Um, and since we've had a chance to actually go uh, back to Alaska in the winter to be uh, there for the ceremonial start, uh, and the, the official start. And you're talking about this Friday and what an important day this is for getting ready is actually the Friday between the going to the banquet and going to the ceremonial start. start we went to Dallas CV's kennel, had a chance to meet him and right behind his dogs. And so that, uh, that really solidified actually to be behind dogs on snow. That was a treat for us. That's how a lot of people get hooked, Richard and Patty. I, I know we talked about that on a previous episode. There have been people that have actually became Iditarod mushers by taking one of those tours, whether it be a tour like at Dallas's or, or uh, Mitch's place uh, inland or on the glaciers there uh, with the cruise ship. So yeah, there have been several Iditarod mushers who got hooked on the sport just like you. Before I turn it over to Michelle with her question, so you guys got involved in 2010, which is truly the, the entrance of the new way of following Iditarod with Facebook and you know the trackers and all that sort of stuff that, that sort of came on at the same time, right about that time, because obviously that was... That was when most of us were introduced to social media around that time. And I think that the Iditarod changed for better and for worse for uh, for um, being able to follow it as fans. You could literally follow it at your fingertips. You could do it 24 hours a day if you wanted to. And I'm interested before, again, we turn it over to Michelle, how much time do you guys spend following the Iditarod uh, during this couple of weeks? Is it an hour or two a day? Are you guys obsessed fans? What is it? Patty? Well, it, it you know, it, it definitely depends. We have, you know, on our calendar months in advance, we have this weekend, we, we know when the, when the starts are going and, and last night we watched the, um, the the whole banquet which was just about three hours that was streamed live going on um one of the things that that we definitely do and i and i know um i know you guys have not been big i did or at insider people uh we we checked last night we first joined as i did or at insiders in 2013 okay. so so we we have been uh, insiders since then and for people who don't know that means you pay i can't remember it's you know 38 dollars something like that and that gives you um access to the trackers to videos to live streams to to video Inter feed, interviews interviews um so it it depends if stuff is really brewing you know, sometimes in the middle of my work day, I might still, you know, take a look. Oh, let's see what's going on. Who's who's going where? What's what's happening? And for us always and, and what one of the things we appreciate so much about your show, Robert, is at the end of the day, we might have been looking and gathering information. We count on tuning in to find out what you have to say, what you've gathered up and going on to sum up the day. So I'm not sure exactly how many hours or minutes that ends up being, but we're paying attention. And sometimes I might be at work and I get a text, 
did did you see what happened? You know, <laughs> or you know, so and so dropped out, or 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 look at how many they they dropped three dogs at that one. It's like, oh my goodness, better get online and see what's going on. So I, I guess the question but, is, but, it, Robert, it, let me just jump in. One of the things I do, I keep the insider with the tracker on my computer up for the entire race. Wow. So that was my question. My question is, is it worth the 39 or 49? There's three levels. There's one for $49, which is sort of the premium version of Insider. Uh, then we have the $39 one, which is sort of that middle of the road. You get the live tracking and the whole nine yards. And then they have the free version, which is literally just um, updates uh, via email or text. So is it worth, as fans... Is it worth the $39 investment? It's the best investment for entertainment for $30 that I can imagine. For two weeks, we basically have entertainment. <laughs> wow, that's saying something, isn't it, Michelle? It sure is, Robert. I'm curious to know, since you guys have had insiders since 2013, and Robert started doing the mushing show uh, late 2009, early 2010 with Alex. Um, when did you guys become fans of mushing, which back in the day we had a different name for it, but I want to know when you guys became fans of mushing and knowing that we have never subscribed to insider and Robert does come up with some pretty valuable ways to summarize the day. How do you think we've done over the years without <laughs> having that inside track? You've got your own sources, which are different than they have. They have the advantage of being out on the trail. Um, uh, but you have the, my sense is you have a connection, especially with the kennels, uh, that gives you uh, perspective. Plus, you're a musher. And so your interpretation of what's going on may be different than mine because I've, I've, I'm not a musher. And so I'm interested in uh, what you're seeing going on and your thoughts strategically. Because one of the things that I've learned is how important uh, the strategy is for the different mushers you know, when they're taking their, their 24s, where are they taking their eights? Uh, how much rest are they trying to shave off? Where are they doing that? How much capacity are they keeping in the team? Because uh, I've seen mushers go flying out and then get reeled back in by somebody who took a little more time. Uh, and I appreciate uh, your perspective on that. Well, thank you very much for that. Uh, and first off, the caveat is I have not run Iditarod yet, so I don't have that much of an insider perspective, but at least I have uh, the the many years of being behind a dog sled that I hope Absolutely. I can have that insight for sure. But back to Michelle's question, when did you start following our podcast? Do you guys recall? We, we were trying to figure that out. And um, my memory is actually... Uh, it was somewhere about 11. Yeah, I was going to guess some, something like 11. We did. I, I, I was looking, and that's that's why we were able to look up uh, I did at Insider because we had paid them some money, and so we had a date, and we we okay. didn't realize oh we didn't have a particular date going on. But I think I think once once we really got going and things were happening online, very quickly your podcast and particularly you and Alex um, just it was so valuable to us. And I think stumbled on it and said, "Ooh, this is good." So so we over over the time, um, you know, I it's it was a little bit. I, I appreciated so much work that went into it. I feel like if something was really good, I would want to go on social media and like it or say, really appreciate that all going on. I know these are the kind of shows that don't make themselves. It takes a tremendous amount of work. So 
I appreciated that. And I also appreciate, and I think one of the things that you have done so well over the years is been open and put out the word about, hey, you know, if you have a question, you have something you want to know going on. And I felt like we very often had questions. And so often would say, hey, how about this? And whether whether we want to, to put it in a public comment or, or send a message and felt like, oh, goodness, it was fun. And every once in a while, you get a little shout out about, oh, question came. It's like, oh, that was my question. That was that was really fun. Because especially watching it um, from afar, um, I don't even know how many thousands of miles, but we are thousands of miles away from where you are, as well as there are many other people all over the world watching who are even farther away than we are. It is so awesome to have access to people who are living in Alaska, who can also give us sometimes some of the in inside scoop about living in Alaska and how that fits in here. The lifestyle. The, the, the other piece I'd just like to add is you make it personable. Well, uh, yep. it's, it's not just this thing out there. Uh, I've, I know we're, we're going to be, you're going to do sometime tonight, the, uh, the, the profile for a, a musher and the fact that you've focused on the middle and the back of the pack so often. Right. Um, that I felt like I was connecting with the people who were on the trail through those, that, uh, that that's different than uh, some of the other cat podcasts we listen to, because we do listen to several. Yeah, but and that that is like we said last night. That is one of our our our, our big pieces to our puzzles to make sure that we do cover those folks. And, and like you just said, Richard, there are now other podcasts that that have come on on the scene. And I, I am not afraid of the competition by any stretch. I've been on a couple of those other podcasts myself, and I am I am happy that there are other perspectives. And I tell people all the time, and this is definitely for the fans that are listening right now. You know, there are hundreds of ways to follow uh, the National Football League or the National Hockey League or or Major League Baseball or whatever. There has to be those different perspectives. And I think that that is very important to be able to get that story across and be able to share those different things that are happening during during this uh, couple of weeks. Because for, for many fans, for many fans, it is all consuming. And we just heard from Patty about about how she follows and and Richard he he is such a diligent fan that he has the tracker up on his computer for two straight weeks. I, I'd have to say that is a about of a good of a testimonial for for that thirty nine bucks as you could possibly get. So I, I think that Richard might be just watching it like a hawk in case he has a slippage in his choice over Patty, so he doesn't want to lose for sure. But so other other than we don't we don't do that. <laughs> In, in terms of competition, who's who we're rooting for? We haven't done that over the years. Oh, okay. Well, we're gonna we're gonna talk about our picks here at the yep. end of the show for sure. So let's let's uh, reel this in just a little bit and uh, talk about what else is happening. As we mentioned on uh, on uh, Iditarod Week, if you will, uh, today is all about those last minute preparations. Of course, that will lead into tomorrow, and and that's when. Uh, the rubber truly hits the road for a lot of these guys after the ceremonial start. And they they uh, spend that last night in a bed for the next couple of weeks. And they, you know, they're, they're out there kissing babies and shaking hands with the sponsors and everything tomorrow. That's when it really starts to, to really seem real to a lot of these guys. And we're going to talk a lot about that tomorrow on to, or what's happening tomorrow on to, tomorrow night's show. But this Today, it's sort of the, like the calm before the storm for a lot of people. And I think a lot of people are trying to figure out what's happening, uh, at least from a fan's perspective. They're they're trying to figure out who is going to be their favorite, who are they going to watch, how are they going to watch, what are they going to do, follow the race, and that sort of thing. But before we jump into that, and before we even do our musher profile, we talked a little bit about um, what uh, Richard and Patty's uh, day looks like and of course they're a long time podcast fan fans of ours and they've sort of told us 
what they like about our podcast and others. But I have a, a very important question for you guys. And I think a lot of fans would say they have the same question as well to us. And that is from both of you guys. And we'll start with Richard this time first is what is one thing or a couple of things that we could do better to meet the fans needs as a podcast? Challenging question. The distinction I was talking about in terms of, of connecting to people. I don't know whether there's an opportunity in some ways during the, the race itself. Um, you, you refer to conversations that you may have with somebody's kennel. Um, is it a chance to have somebody from one of those kennels that has something exciting going on in the race to actually come on for just a little bit, uh, even if it's five, 10 minutes? Uh, I, that, I think, would connect even more with the race. That's the I one like that it. comes to my mind. I like that for sure. Patty, what are what are your uh, suggestions, if you have any? Well, I, I have to say, I always like it, and I think you could do more of, of uh, sometimes sort of polling people about, um, you know, something going on and and to say hey here's a here's a question who has who has anything that you know they'd like to to throw in i'm always interested in knowing like i love i love when you guys are always asking um mushers you know what's your favorite snacks to bring along or things going on but it would be interesting to just periodically if there's a question you can ask of the fans who are following and just to have people if they would like to toss in you know not to call you up but you know on a post or on something to be able to to put things on i think so two two great piece of advice there uh see if we can get um uh mushers handlers uh husbands wives boyfriends girlfriends whomever on to speak and to poll. And before we uh, have Michelle answer her side, I think a big question that a lot of people has is why are we constantly doing this in the middle of the night, uh, especially for folks that are not in Alaska? And uh, as we mentioned last night, if this airs at 7 or 8 p.m. Alaska time, that's bedtime for a lot of people uh, on the East Coast. And I have no idea what time it is uh, right now in Europe, but I can only imagine it's probably the middle of the night for sure. But the reason that we do that is because we like to have the day settle. And I know this is a 24 hour race, but uh, if we do it in the evening, things usually calm down a little bit, at least in the social media sphere about uh, all of the hubbub that is going on during the work hours. Michelle, is there anything that you could add that we could do a little bit better? There is absolutely no way possible for us to get this done before 7 p.m. We have <laughs> so much going on that we're lucky if we can slam down a slice of pizza before we sit down and, and get this show going. So I hope that people can appreciate the fact that podcasting is our passion. It has never made us any money. And <laughs> that's not the complaint. That that's just the reality of it. We do this because it's our passion, but we also do this because we like to bring the perspective of a dog musher and a fan and a handler to the forefront of what it is to be in this lifestyle. This is a lifestyle choice. And not a lot of people understand the fact that the race is literally only 10, 12 days. Mushers spend the entire year preparing for it. Sure. But that's not the only things that they do. And I think that we could start talking about some of the things that the mushers actually do. I like that. In I, the off season. I like that for sure. And I know, and, we, I know we've mentioned that before, you know, we talk about uh, professional kennels versus rec kennels, not rec kennels, but um, uh, uh, kennels where people have to work, you know, where they have to have full-time jobs and then they're training in the middle of the night and all of that, Michelle. Right. And, and on, what Patty and Richard were um, hitting on with the polls. I liked it when you and Tony were doing the polls last year too. I thought that was a fantastic way to bring in the perspective of the fans. But just to let you guys know, when Robert asked me to do the musher profiles this year, Tony did them in years past, 
I don't know how she had the time to get those done. Honestly, um, she has a, a very unique perspective as being a volunteer for her entire life with Iditarod. So she knows a lot of the mushers firsthand and she can get in through the back door. I'm not getting in through the back door. And so my musher profiles are not going to be as in depth as hers, which is unfortunate, but I'm doing the best I can. Getting their handlers, their family members, and even the mushers themselves to answer three simple, silly little questions that take less than 90 seconds is proving to be very hard. Um, and I say that because of a couple of things. A lot of people don't even realize who I am, let alone what it is that we're trying to do. We are not trying to promote Iditarod. We are trying to promote the lifestyle, the sport, the dogs, and the musher themselves. And by giving them a platform, an opportunity to talk about who they are and what they're about with our fans is different than what Insider is doing. For sure, for sure. And uh, moving on with that, I think it's very important to ask the people that are listening right now, what do you want? Let us know in the comments or on social media about what you would like to see on the show. And uh, of course, uh, if you do have something you would like us to talk about or somebody you would like us to interview, let us know for sure. And we will do what we can. We are going to open up that call in number again. And for new fans to the podcast, you may or may not know, unless you have literally been under a rock for the last three or four months now, Michelle and I are now the owners of Mushing Magazine. So I think Michelle thinks it's her passion but unfortunately or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, now we have to do it because it is our job. We have to produce content uh, under that mushing magazine guys. So I think it's going to be that interesting. That doesn't take away the passion. That just puts a different P in front of that word. For sure. So uh, before we get involved with the musher profile, Richard or Patty, do you have anything else to add before we jump into that? I, I do want to say for people in, in our family, I'm the social media person. Uh, Richard doesn't do social media, so I kind of monitor that. If people are interested, there are there are nearly all the mushers have their own Facebook and Instagram sites, which is really interesting. If things are really cooking, sometimes some that's really fun to get there. There's also the um, Iditarod 2024 fan page that I follow a lot. There's 18,000 followers on that wow. page on Facebook. That there's So there's a lot of things happening. And, you know, there's smaller kind of things too. But so if you're a social media person, that's also a way to, to get some information. And then, the, then there's also just like the newspapers and the Anchorage News or Alaska Public Media. So people can, if you want to play around and then find which of those you know meets your needs and, and goes goes with your heart and you don't have to go to them all day long you can just every once in a while pop up but which brings a question to richard since you are not active on social media aside from having the tracker and all of that that goes on with that what are some of your sources that you like to to use to follow is it the anchorage daily news or alaska public media or where both of those Okay. I I will uh, just go on and do a Google search most every day to, to each of those say, what what do they have to say about the race? Uh, and, and then I read what they say, say about the race. Are, um, you guys, are you guys looking at anything more national? Uh, I know a Google search and it pulls up obviously Alaska stories and national, but is there any, obviously we, we live here, so we, we get firsthand knowledge. But are, are there any other good sources aside from social media or the Alaska media that's doing anything? Uh, my experience is what they're doing is like the AP is pulling off, especially material from Alaska Daily News. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, in terms of original kinds of things, I'm not really seeing anything that, that is consistently providing me with fresh information that I don't already have. 
Yep. And I think that's 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 a valid uh, valid point. I, I would say that if a out of town musher or potentially out of country musher is is involved with the race, I would imagine that that local media is very active as well. I see articles that pop up all the time from mushers from Minnesota or North Dakota or, or France or wherever uh, they share their stories as well. Michelle, are you about ready for our musher profile of the evening? As ready as I'm ever going to be. Let's roll. I want to let you guys in on something that I discovered. Have you, Patty and Richard, heard of a documentary that was on National Geographic called The Yukon River Run? I have not. No. No. It was aired in 2015. And it was all about a once in a lifetime northern adventure. And there were uh, two people involved that had participated in the Yukon Quest and the Iditarod. One of them is a veteran from 1981 and 1983. The, we are talking about Neil Eklund oh, and yeah. his son, Loro. And so on Loro's musher profile on the Iditarod page, it is blank. So I found that very interesting. I dove deep as I could to find out what I could about Loro. I did try to reach out to him and his kennel, and obviously I did not get um, any information back. But Loro and Neil are competitive dog mushers. They own and operate a... Um, adventure sport guiding expedition business called Skookum Expeditions out of Two Rivers, Alaska. So very far north of us. Um, and, and they do uh, subsistence activities with uh, for their dogs to gather uh, fish and probably moose. Um, they take people out on excursions in the Alaska bush and, um, you know, these are a couple of very rugged, self-made men that describe themselves as um, uh, those types of people that Jack London once wrote about. <laughs> you know, I, I have followed uh, Laurel for a long time, and I, I love seeing his journey. And just the other day, he posted a picture on Facebook of his dog truck. And when you talk about old school type mushers, these guys are whom I think about. You know, everybody has this this ideal, whether it's romanticized or not, about a lot of these um, a, a lot of these mushers and how we live up here. But if you got a chance to see uh, his dog truck, it, it, it really harkens back to like the seventies. It looks mm -hmm. like a dog truck you would see down on the Avenue in, in the 1970s, the way he had his dog box built and, you know, the old wooden sleds with the crates popped on, on top and all of that. I, I really like this guy. I know he, he really flies under the weather or, or under the, under the weather, under the radar. And I I'm excited to see him, see him run. Uh, Richard or Patty, do you know anything about Loro? I do not. I was just going to to look at their their page for their kennel of going on. Interesting. I I don't. And it's interesting when people make make choices to be really minimal with what they're sharing. Uh man, uh, Patty, I got to tell you in all of my years helping Robert out with this behind the scenes stuff mostly, I've never seen a blank musher profile on on the Iditarod page at least they got his website up there so if uh, those people that are actually interested will go click on his website his website is well put together um and uh it it, it doesn't have his his race career so I'm guessing Robert he would be considered a Iditarod rookie he's uh, a rookie I, I, yeah he he is a rookie and I, I don't now, know. I, I did say that loosely because I know he's been using his dog teams for his entire life for trapping and hunting and participated in races and things like that. Just not Iditarod. I, I know that he is sponsored in one way or another by 
a very famous Alaskan artist, John Van Zyl, who is also an Iditarod finisher as well. And they are doing some stuff together, whether they're doing some paintings for for sponsorship or some type of deal with that. But if I if information if I recall what I saw today, I think he had a picture from the banquet last night. And this may be misremembering 100 percent. But I think there was a picture of him where he got a box of cookies from grandpa or somebody outside that sent him some homemade cookies uh, sent up for for the start of Iditarod. Patty, do you know what I'm talking about or was that somebody else? I was thinking it was him. I, I was do. thinking it was. Yeah. yeah. Guys, for if you're listening, let us know if, if we're totally off base and that's somebody else. If so, we will definitely make a correction tomorrow. So that's what that's why this thing is so fun when we do these musher profiles. We try to introduce people to mushers that you may not know a lot about. If you're in the mushing scene, as soon as she said his dad's name, I knew exactly who it was. So I'm very familiar <laughs> with the family. However, however, none of you had heard of the Yukon River Run. So I really would love to know how many people listening to our show watched that series in 2015 or are going to go watch it now because there's only eight episodes. I, I, I have heard of that, but I thought it was called something else. I, I'm not a big uh, Nat Geo fan, uh, but uh, yeah, we'll definitely check that out for sure. So let's let's move on and let's talk about what everybody has been waiting for. As we said, this is sort of the calm before the storm. Uh -oh. We are going to talk about our picks. Nobody covers dog sledding like mushing from First Paw Media. Our team of athletes, volunteers, race organizers, and mushers like Robert and Michelle Forto brings you closer to the sport. If it's happening, we are there. Live from the qualifying races in January and February, the Iditarod in March, and in the summer, mushing takes you on the road with our team and trail tour. We connect you with a history of the sport, in-depth interviews with a top mushers, Ushers, and great storytelling and breaking news all year long. Follow on mushing.com. Okay, guys, so before we do our picks, I wanted to give out a couple of quick facts. In this year's race, we have 38 mushers. We have 27 Alaskans, four international mushers, 16 rookies, 22 veterans, three champions, three former champions. We also have 11 women, 11 women and 27 men, which is pretty typical of the stats. Typically it's about uh, one third women to two thirds men. I would like to see a lot more women uh, in the race, but uh, hey, that's what we have this year. So first off, it is a, a pretty small field in terms of, of the number of mushers out on the trail. At the media briefing just the other day, uh, Mark Nordman me uh, mentioned, uh, man, when they had 96 or 98 or whatever teams they had a few years ago, he said, man, that was a lot to handle. Uh, and he is happy as as the um, as the uh, race coordinator that there's not that many people out on the trail. He also said that it is going to be a very competitive team uh, field. And there is a lot of talk on all of the other media pages. We talked about uh, the newspapers and Alaska Public Media, and they are saying that about 25% of the field has a real chance of winning. And I think that that's pretty impressive when you have this small of a field and, and a quarter of them or more have a real chance of, uh, of really taking this, thing, uh, taking this thing going. So before we jump in, Michelle... Yeah. And, and I just want to say, and because we have so many rookies, which we're pretty much assuming the rookies are not going to win, that means that the veteran teams are very, very strong. Very competitive. Right, yeah. and that's what I was going to um, go on as well. Robert, this seems like a very large rookie field this year. I don't recall ever in my assisting with you that we've had 16 rookies that does seem like quite a bit especially yes. out of 38 
Yeah, so that's that's a little under half. Of course, my uh, I did a math is not uh, firing all cylinders yet, but I think that's a pretty big rookie field. But that's really saying something about the the health of the sport. I think that that's that's a great thing to have that many rookies in this year's race. And of course, we could talk all about why we have a low field and all that. I mean, we could probably talk about it that in in many days coverage moving forward. So let's do it this way. Can, uh, can, I, can I interject something just for a moment? Go for it. You were talking about women in the field. And yes. you were hoping there will be more. And what I do is I look at that junior Iditarod field, and there are a number of very capable young women coming up, uh, especially uh, I, I look at that, that junior Iditarod field and say, wow, and the number of rookies that are this there's health going forward. Oh yeah. I, yeah, I, I, agree. I agree. I agree with you, Richard. Um, it seemed to me that the uh, ladies of the junior Iditarod had a bit more ambition to go on in dog mushing than the young men that I was interviewing. Yeah. And you, you, you got firsthand knowledge of that. You were down at uh, connect Lake at the start and you interviewed. I most cut, of I the cut my teeth. I cut my teeth there. You cut your teeth as <laughs> as a as an interviewer. Hey, so yeah, we had we had some great interviews there. I know you didn't get a chance to get all of them, but the the folks that you did interview, uh, yeah, it sounded like the the ladies there they are they're coming for it. And I think that uh, folks like uh, Emily Robinson and and all of those uh, guys and gals will uh, will truly be the next generation of mushers. So let's kick this off. This is uh, the the top five. Uh, people that each of us is follow, following for the race. And we're going to go ladies first, since we talked about um, uh, the women in the field. So let's start with Patty, and then we'll go to Michelle, then we'll go to Richard, and then I will round us out. Who are your top five? And they could be in any order, or it could be in, in first and, and last. And then if it's not in your top five, do you have a favorite rookie? Patty. Okay. Well, first I want to say thrilled that Aaron Burmeister's back. It, you know, he, he, he made, yes, I'm retiring. I'm finished, but I, I, I'm, I'm really thrilled that he's back. I, I think he's, um, that they talked about that. Are you in it to win it? And he said, oh yeah, I'm, I, I, I think he's got a great shot at it. I got to put Dallas in, you know, he, that it was, he had to deal with the tragedy of part of his team being hit by the, the snow machine and losing dogs and all going on. I mean, that was really, really hard, but um, he's, he's ready to roll and heard that he's got a, a few dogs from his dad's kennel. So I thought, okay, anytime, anytime you can get some of Mitch's dogs in, that's also good. Ryan, I think, did a great job as as sort of ambassador this year of going out, and I I think he's hungry to to bring a, a, a second one. So I I would support him, and I would love 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 to see a woman, and I, the the two top women I see, I think Millie is uh, you know she is great. I come from Danish people, so I'm always pulling for that, but. I love, she's such a dog woman and I, I love her. I think that could be good. And Jesse Royer has just went on and on and on and on. And I, I think she's got a good shot to be in the top five. And I also just have to say, I got to be following Emily's dad, Wally. I love that, you know, that he was getting advice from, his daughter about, you know, what do you need to do that? Like, I think that's, that's fabulous. So that's, so, that's so my, do you, have, do you have a, a, a rookie, uh, a rookie of the year, if you will. And do you care to think who you, your choice is to win? Man, I would love, I would love Aaron to win. I, I like, I, I, I would love Aaron to win that. That would be excellent. I don't know, but I would love him to win. And I know, I know that there's there's a couple of of rookies coming from Minnesota, and I I don't have their their names down right now to to remember which one, but but 
I'm also a, a former Minnesota girl, so I, I'm thinking I'll have to look look up to remember I, who that Aaron, was. Aaron is one of them. Alt, Ultimus. Aaron okay. Ultimus. Aaron Ultimus. Okay. Anna Hennessy as well. Anna Hennessy. Okay. Minnesota. Okay. Uh, I think Minnesota people. There. there you go. All right. So we have we have Patty's choices. We have Burmeister, CV, Reddington, uh, Horsled, Jesse Royer. She would love to see Aaron win it. Aaron Burmeister. And she mentioned six. She did and, say Robinson. And she she loves the Robinson story. But, but, I, don't, I don't think he's gonna win, but, but we we're following him. Of we're course, following yeah. we're following. We're following everybody for sure. But those those are Patty's top choices, Michelle. Mm -hmm. And I have no idea what you're going to say, Michelle. Who is on your ticket? Well, and not in any particular order. I I think that uh, Ryan is definitely hungry. Um, he is a shy individual. And I got to tell you guys, um, during junior, I did a rod as I was walking back from over by the Knick hall where I was posted down, taking photos. I was not at the start line where everybody else was. I wanted some more candid shots, but he saw me walking back across the lake and he's waving at me, two arms in the air, come over here, come over here. And I, I was a little bit taken aback for one, he recognized who I was. And for two, he was dying to share with me a little bit of a story about his junior musher. And that was that they almost had a 20 minute penalty penalty because the young man left his bib on his bed at <laughs> home. And so they had to scramble to get somebody to go get the bib and get it back to the young man. And they were strapping it on him as he was being taken to the shoot. And Ryan was dying to tell me that I did not get that on the uh, show that Robert dropped um, because he dropped it before I could do that add on. So tonight I chose to share that with everybody. Um, obviously things worked out well, but quite funny. Ryan was laughing about it. He was like, isn't that just like a teenager? And I'm like, well, Ryan, let's not jinx ourselves make sure you don't forget your own bib. So <laughs> he's going to do great, but I really got a kick out of that because, um, he, he is really a shy person. So for him to have that moment with me really did mean a lot. And um, I, I learned something different about him uh, during that junior Iditarod. Uh, he was just so enamored and smiling and, and so pleased with the kids. And, and that really showed a lot of mentoring. Um, so Ryan Reddington, uh, I also put down uh, Nick Petit. I think he's always hungry for it. Um, I did too put down... Uh, Millie Porslid. I think that it's Millie's time to, um, I mean, a few years ago, she was in the top three. I think she's definitely going to be in the top five, not just the top 10. Um, I, I think that she's going to do quite well um, in the field of women out there. Um, Jesse Holmes, Dallas CV. Dallas, I think he's going to, I think Dallas is my chosen winner simply because he's uh a, he he's a self-described strategist more so than he describes himself as a musher and yeah. i really um i really admired that description he gave himself and and we heard him say that in the film that they show during the um banquet we got a preview of it in the media conference and you know he said uh I'm going to live to 120. Technology is great. It was just that attitude and that kind of uh, way of thinking and, and reminding ourselves that he's under 45. Yeah, he, he said uh, with that uh, 120 uh, uh, lifespan, he said, when I get to 120, am I going to think about uh, my sixth win, my fifth win, or my first. And uh, he is truly the strategist. And uh, he said in that film that uh, he 
he thinks about every single second of the race. Every single second matters. And it's obviously an accumulation of seconds that uh, that will win the right. race for sure. So do you have do you have a favorite? Right. And I think that that's what is going to. Um, so Jesse and Nick and Ryan all kind of, in my opinion, and it's not much people, um, they kind of run the same way. And Dallas is definitely going to over strategize. Um, and, and so I think it's going to be a lot of fun to watch whoever out there is, uh, going to strategize with Dallas is where you're going to see the competition really at. And, and who's your rookie that you want to follow? If, uh, I don't think you had any rookies. I want in your honorable list. mention. I would love to see Jason Mackey finish in the top 10. Um, I, my rookie choice, I don't really have a rookie choice. I just love seeing the rookies make it. Um, you know, past Unicolite and, and onto the coast. That's what I like. I like to see the, the rookies hold on as long as they can. Yeah, I, I, I think there's an excellent field there for sure. Let's go to Richard. Who are your top five? And do you have an ultimate favorite? And do you have a rookie that uh, may or may not be in that top five? So in terms of, and again, as Michelle said, in no particular order, Dallas, a five-time champion. I think he's returning pretty energized. Uh, the fact that he signed up last summer uh, said he was ready. Um, and so he's gone through some uh, difficult times, and um, I think he's ready to roll again. And so it's hard to bet against Dallas. And the fact that I've been to his kennel. I've been behind his dogs. Uh, so I have, I have a sense of a bit of personal relationship that uh, adds to that. I have to include Ryan. He uh, was 2023 champion. Uh, I agree with all the comments that have been said before. Uh, he's a solid musher. Uh, and I, I'm expecting him to uh, do well. I have a soft spot at this point for Aaron. Um, he's such a top flight musher. Uh, and I thought he was done. He's returning. He's energized. But I have the sense this may be his last. And will he really just put out uh, and have his team really ready to go? I also have Jesse Royer in. Uh, she is such a consistent musher. Uh, she just does really well. And other people can fade. And there's Jesse still there. Um, and I, I think she could be easily in the top five, if not way up there even further. I have a different person than been mentioned before. That's Matt Hall. Um, as I've been watching him, I, I really see him on an upward trajectory. Uh, and I would like to see him uh, do really well and be in that top five uh, this year. I have a couple of additional people that I'm going to follow because I met them and spent time talking with them. Uh, we were there at the vet check uh, in 2014, had a chance to talk with Travis uh, Beals and Matt Failer. Uh, and great conversations with both of them and I've followed them ever since. Um, I don't think they're gonna be in the top five, but I'd like to see them do really well. So- And do and you have a rookie as well? I do not have a rookie, okay. Uh, but in terms of who I think has the best chance of winning at this point, I think it's going to be a duel again uh, between Dallas and Aaron. And I think Dallas is going to win. All right. So we have uh, we have Dallas twice, and you have Aaron for um, for for the winner on her side. So Aaron and Dallas are are the. Uh, are, are the ones for at least three of the four of us. So in my case, I don't necessarily have any, <laughs> anybody in particular that I follow. And I say this every single year, and I am the same in all sports. I do not have a favorite team of any sport, nor do I have a favorite player. I like to watch sports in general for for just the 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 joy of watching sports and of course the stories that come with that that's why i'm such a big fan of the olympics mainly the winter olympics over the summer olympics but i really like just that sport aspect of it and the stories so my picks 
are Matt Failer, and I pick him because I always pick him because he is a heck of a nice guy. Uh, he yes. is he is a, a neighbor of ours, meaning that he shares the trails with us. He shares the swamp. He shares the swamp with <laughs> us, and uh, he does a heck of a lot of work. Uh, on our trails here and I have to give him kudos for that uh, he does a lot more work than I do and he is just one of those guys that puts his head down and just gets at it all year long and uh, does a lot of great things for the community uh, just recently he hosted he and his wife hosted the Willow Jr. 100 halfway checkpoint and did all of that work for that so uh, one of my picks is is my perennial Matt Failer. Uh, Jesse Holmes, I pick almost every year. I think he's always hungry. Uh, he's always out there getting after it. He lives out there off of the Denali Highway, totally off grid, and he is a musher's musher for sure. He is he is the guy when you think of old school mushers. Mushers, we talked about Loro. I think Jesse fits that mold pretty well uh, there as well. Uh, Anna Barrington is, is who I think is really going to do well this year. Uh, and I say that for a couple of reasons. And the biggest reason I think, and this was a strategic decision on their part way back, uh, when it was announced at the banquet, I believe that's when they signed up at the banquet, they said only one of us is going to run this year and it is going to be my sister. And uh, since they are twins, I'm sure you could figure out which one of those sisters said that. But uh, Anna Barrington is uh, is going to be interesting to follow because she has both groups of dogs. So she has uh, both sisters' dogs this year. So I think it's going to be interesting. And it's interesting because they typically follow each other down the trail. And, and if you're a longtime follower of Iditarod, you will see their little trackers following down the trail for most of the time. Just looks like they're having the best time in, in the world. And these guys do a lot of stuff together all year. I don't know how many times, Michelle, you and I have run into these two ladies at the at the grocery store or wherever in the community. They're always together. It's true twindom, isn't it? Absolutely. In fact, I ran into them at Junior Iditarod because they had some of their dogs uh, loaned out to the sweet young lady from Norway. They did. They did. Okay, so we have Barrington Holmes Failer. Then I have who I think is going to win. And Robert, I Robert, could you wait just a second? I, I've got to say this because I hope that Alex Stein is listening you and Alex Stein have chosen the Barrington twins every single year as your top five for the female. To yeah, we we all we always love following these guys. I know when Ali Zirkel was running, uh, that was Alex Alex's big pick. Uh, he loved to follow Ali, and I, I've always liked to follow the Barringtons mainly because hey, they you know as as Richard said, uh, you have that personal connection, whether how big or how small. If you know these people in real life, that's uh, that's who you root for for sure. So, I think my my choice for winner is going to be Pete Kaiser. I think Pete is going to is going to do uh, he's going to do very well, and and he is my choice to win. I think that uh, a lot of people out there listening would probably agree with me there. So we'll see how Pete does. I typically do not say who I think is going to be the winner. Now, my number fifth pick is also my rookie pick, and that is Will Rhodes. And I have a little bit of personal connection with, with Will and his lovely wife, Brenda Mackey. Uh, I would think that almost half of our kennel Maybe Michelle are from uh, Brenda and Will. Is that correct? Um, Pretty close. All but, uh, well, there's 35 dogs, and I want to say all but 13 of them are Mackie dogs. Yep. Yeah, so, hey, we we really are fans of, uh, of Brenda and Will. And so. I didn't realize Will was a rookie. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. More power to them. I found it interesting that you did not list 
Ryan or Dallas. So you guys, we're really going to have a, a race on our hands now that we know that Robert didn't pick anybody that well, we think. Is like I win. said, like I said, I do not have favorites. I do not have, um, you know, the, the typical fan favorites of, of people that, that everybody follows, but a little bit back more, more back to, to will, uh, if you really follow Alaskan mushing, whether it's Brenda or Will running in a mid-distance race, they are almost always in in the top five and often in the top two or three. They have a very, very good kennel. And I know a lot of people think, oh, the Mackie, then they immediately think about Lance or Jason. But Brenda is, it was, uh, now that Lance has passed on, was Lance's niece. So there are family connections, of course, but uh, an entirely different uh, kennel and and all that uh, being said. So my rookie and my number five is Will Rhodes. I hope he does very well. So uh, Patty or Richard, do you have anything else in regards to picks? Anything other than uh, we talked about? Uh, my sense is it's going to be a great race. There's going to be a lot of little things that are going to happen. What I'm hoping is that there won't be any sickness among the dogs. That's changed some of the dynamics in past races. So I'm wishing good health to the dogs uh, because I think that'll make a, a big difference. And then we'll just see what happens. Right. And if I could just speak on that for just a second, for folks that aren't big time fans of Iditarod, um, uh, illnesses of one stretch or another are often uh, part of Iditarod. Anytime you bring in 800 dogs or however many, again, my Iditarod math is not perfect right now, but okay. anytime you bring in that number of dogs into a checkpoint uh, there, of course, just like a, a group of school kids. Uh, whenever you have that many dogs or that many kids together, there's obviously uh, that uh, that uh, issue. Uh, Michelle just did the math. 624 dogs if everybody starts with 16. Correct. So, so that's that's uh, that's pretty impressive. So, yeah, I agree with you there, Richard, for sure. Patty, anything else? Um, one of the things I, I was just reading today, we were talking about that Dallas is under 45. Actually, both Dallas and, and Pete Kaiser are 36. Wow. Wow. Well, and, see, I was being conservative saying under 45 because I didn't right. know if he was right. under 35. So, <laughs> right. So, but, but I know, you know, Dallas was, he was the youngest I did a rod person who who ever ran because he, he turned 18 the day before the race that he that he went so but does it look like okay he went from being an 18 year old to you know middle 30s so not quite the the young buck anymore so that's kind of interesting just to notice that you know that's what I was trying to mention is 36 and he has five under his belt mm -hmm. and you know, his dad is at least Robert's age um, and, and was still running until COVID. So, I mean, there's potential there for Dallas to just really clean house. Yeah, yeah it'll be interesting. Now, but of course, there there are, my goodness, people are, are already messaging us for sure. Uh, Michelle, anything else before we go? Did you have any news from uh, the day that you needed to share on tonight's show to wrap it up? No, I just wanted to make sure to let everybody know this is sort of the calm before the storm. Things will really get happening tomorrow. And uh, we look forward to being with you guys every night between now and the banquet. And things are going to get hot and heavy on our coverage. We're going to share a lot of stuff over on the Mushing Magazine page and all the other social media that we can do. And of course, uh, we will be on every night. And I encourage everybody that's listening to remember that we're on a brand new podcast feed called The Burled Arch. We did separate that from Mushing Podcast uh, just earlier this year because we wanted to keep everything separate. So we will put links to that in the show notes page, wherever you're listening. And please share with your family and friends and let them know about our podcast. Michelle, one thing else in closing. Yes, 
for all of our rabid listeners out there. Please help me wish Robert Forto a very happy birthday tomorrow on March 2nd. Well, thank you very much. And and with that, uh, I, I truly get to do what I love to do every year on my birthday. And, and that... your wedding anniversary wraps it up. Yep. But uh, <laughs> tomorrow uh, I will be out uh, on, on the trails with a group of college kids from Alaska Pacific University. And what a way to spend a birthday than to be out there with your dogs, with a group of new mushers out in the Alaska wilderness. Yeah, enjoying our lifestyle and being able to share it. I, I think that's awesome. Absolutely. Well, Patty and Richard, thank you very much for joining us today. I assume that this is your first podcast. Is that right? It is for me. First mushing podcast. First mushing I podcast. Well, Pat, yeah. Patty is an old hat at this. She's been on podcasts before. And as she said, guys, she is a professional storyteller. She tells stories literally all over the country, and I follow her pretty religiously on social media. Give yourself a plug. How can people follow you, Patty, and, and learn a little bit more about what you do in this storytelling realm? Well, yeah, you can look for me at um, www.pattystoryoneword.com. That's my website. Um, I also tell stories with a partner. Uh, we are the Patchwork Players Story Theater, and we're also on social media going on, and we love telling stories, so it's great. That is awesome. And and this is this is a very interesting world that Patty is in. And I know that our mutual friend Alex Stein, uh, that's probably how you guys met was through this story core deal. And uh, uh, you guys, if you can rip off those stories at, at a whim, I think that's a kind of a special talent. I'm sure you would agree. Well, I think so. And the world of mushing is filled with stories. It is for sure. Well, again, thank you guys very much for joining us. Thank you for being fans of the show and thank you for your perspective. We really appreciate that. So on behalf of our guest today and my co-host, this is Robert for the Burled Arch. We will see you guys next time. Goodbye. Nobody covers dog sledding like mushing from First Paw Media. Our team of athletes, volunteers, race organizers, and mushers like Robert and Michelle Forto brings you closer to the sport. If it's happening, we are there. Live from the qualifying races in January and February, the Iditarod in March, and in the summer, mushing takes you on the road with our team and trail tour. We connect you with a history of the sport, in-depth interviews with a top mushers, Ushers, and great storytelling and breaking news all year long. Follow on mushing.com.